Everyone hear me okay? Good. Yes. Usually not a problem with me. Everyone knows I'm a nice, quiet Canadian. Um, so my name is Grant McAllister. I'm a senior principal engineer with the Amazon Web Services. Uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, Amazon Aurora Postgres. Um, I left off the Postgres on this because like, I wouldn't really want to be talking about the MySQL one at a Postgres conference. So, um, so let's just jump right in. So uh, obviously, Amazon Aurora is part of RDS. Sometimes there's confusion that like, they're different things. But uh, it's all part of the same RDS universe of like, our managed database offering. So we have essentially two offerings now. We have uh, our EBS-based RDS Postgres, which is essentially the community edition with a little bit of small patches around, basically security stuff that just allows us to you know, maintain security in a managed environment. Um, runs on EBS, so this is you know, essentially the same as what you would get if you run on EC2 and you install it and you use EBS and you know, we just manage it for you. Uh, on the other side, we have the newer offering, which is Aurora Postgres, and this is quite different, and we're going to walk through all those changes that we did. Uh, and it runs on the thing we call Aurora Storage, which is a purpose-built, different storage engine that is database aware. So one of the things that we wanted to do um, from my perspective was I don't want to force customers to like choose between these two because they are different for how it looks to the client. So when I show you up here, like the clients talk to these databases in the exact same way. You don't notice any difference. Um, so, you know, PSQL, JDBC, whatever, it all looks the same. So we wanted to make sure we had the same extensions, that we had backup and recovery in the same way. We have high availability and durability, although we have a little stronger story on the Aurora Postgres side. You know, it's secure by default. We have read replicas. We have cross-region snapshots. Um, we have online uh, scale storage for both of them, although it's larger for Aurora. And we have scale compute. Now, there are a few things today that, are, that we haven't finished yet um, for Aurora Postgres. Um, the first two are cross-region replication. Um, we don't have support for that yet, and we don't have outbound logical replication. So we don't support you know, uh, logical replication slots at the moment. Both of those are in work. Um, and of course, since I started this slide, um, the other thing that we've done is we've released uh, Postgres 10 on the RDS Postgres side, and we're still in progress of releasing that on Aurora, but it's coming soon. So you know, from my perspective, the clients should you know, decide which of these databases they want to use based on the capabilities. And I'll talk a little bit about why someone might choose one or the other. Um, the other thing that I'll just note is um, one of the cool things that we've done this year for RDS Postgres that we'll do with Aurora uh, in the future as well is we're providing the preview, uh, we have this preview environment essentially where you can now go use Postgres 11 and today we're actually, um, we had, had a pre-release and now we're actually going to do the beta, I think it's uh, shipping, it's now. done now. So. Yeah. So if you want now you can go use RDS in the preview environment and you can go play with Postgres 11. Um, and we're going to continually update that as the, you know, the beta and the release candidates go along. Um, so we're really excited. And you know, any feedback anyone has about this, love to hear that. Um, it's not really about this talk, but I wanted to kind of make sure everyone knew we uh, were doing that. So let's jump into the base architecture of this thing. So you know, typically, you, know, you have your applications and you have your database. It's going to do read writes. This is our typical you know, regional setup for AWS. We have multiple availability zones. I've just called them the fakey names of AZ1, 2, and 3 here. But that's how you know, pretty much all of our stuff looks, right? What's really different is that in Aurora, you have Aurora storage. And that's what I'm depicting with that sort of purple big blob, right? The lighter purple uh, things are actually storage instances, right? And you might end up running on a very, very large database on hundreds or possibly thousands of these storage nodes in a single region, right? So when you actually go and ask for a database, what happens? Well, we provision a bunch of storage behind the scenes. Um, but you don't actually have to tell how big it is. You just get to say, start a database, and it will grow as you add stuff to it. Um, and what I'm depicting here is that we do six copies of your data, right? Each of these chunks are 10 gig chunks. And so the different colors represent the six copies spread across the three availability zones, right, for durability. So it's three full copies plus uh, deltas and then uh, three delta copies. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we do there. So when you do a write in this system, there are no checkpoints in the engine, right? It's only log vectors. It's not a log-based, you know, like an LSM or anything like that. It's literally we're taking database log vector changes and sending them down to our storage. There we have blocks, and then we 
basically do the equivalent of what happens on recovery, right, of merging the vectors into a block. And so when you do a read, essentially, you know, you get a block back, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't look different from the upper parts of the engine because what you're getting back is still just Postgres blocks. It's the exact same block format. If you went and looked at one of these blocks, you would see that it looks exactly like it does on stock Postgres. So nothing different there. So let's say something happens to one of these blocks. Like we do 406 quorum, and I'll talk about why we do that. But let's say you miss writing to that one block, or that one block dies or has a problem, right? What the cool thing is, is this is a distributed system, so it does distributed recovery, right? So when you go and, you know, need that data, well, you have another copy over here, right? And, you know, you can get information down to the block level or at a whole chunk, a repair happening, right? So if just one of the writes was missing, it can send just that chunk over. If the whole machine fails, right, then we'll just move, we'll make a copy of that chunk somewhere else, right, from one of the other copies. So the cool thing about this is it's not like the days where, you know, you had a hard drive fail and you've got a terabyte on it. Oh, now I've got to go do a terabyte worth of work through this single threaded process. This is all happening, like I said, in parallel across possibly thousands of machines, right? So the other really interesting thing uh, about this system is we really think of it as a clustered storage system, right? Because if you want a read-only node, and we call them Aurora replicas, but they're really read-only nodes. I hate that name, but I'm not the marketing guy. So, um, so we have read-only nodes, and you can attach them to storage, right? So you don't have to actually make copies of your database because you're just attaching to the storage. And you, can, you obviously read from the storage, and then we do asynchronous invalidation and update, and I'll get a little more detail about how we flow stuff over so that the stuff in memory stays consistent, I mean, eventually consistent, um, as, as you would expect. We can run up to 15 read-only nodes plus the writer. And the cool thing, of course, about this is that if you have a failure of like an AZ, right, you can just promote the read-only node to a writer, right? So the high availability portion, the durability is down in the storage layer. And so even if you don't have a node, you could just fire up a new one, but it allows you to have that high availability without actually having to have a lot of copies of your data, right? And as I said, this auto scales up to 64 terabytes today. We've actually had customers ask us for things like 256 terabytes, which I'm just like, for a single OLTP instance, is like, ooh, okay. I don't, maybe you want to re-architect, but well, I guess if you want that, we'll figure out how to do it. So let's talk a little bit about the log base storage and the changes here. So for a lot of you, this is going to be you know, kind of old school stuff, but I'm just going to walk through sort of how Postgres logically thinks about doing writing. So if you had a whole bunch of queued work, so if you think about each of those little yellow blocks being like a commit, right? The cool thing is Postgres has group commit, right? So it allows multiple things to get committed at once. And when that happens, they go into the log buffer, right? And now you need to flush the log buffer out, right? So that's great. But if a whole bunch of other queued work shows up on a bunch of other sessions, that <coughs> lightweight lock now is protecting the log buffer while it flushes. No, no one else can actually get into the log buffer, right? It's essentially blocked. So you have to wait for that to get down to storage. So you can see how this can cause a problem, because the larger the log buffer is, the longer that takes. So the longer you're blocked from being able to, you know, essentially acknowledge that storage and allow new queued work to come in. So this causes a bit of, you know, sort of delay in motion, so it's not like a nice smooth pipeline. On Aurora Postgres, what we do, as this work comes in that wants to be committed, we just flow it down. There is no centralized control of that. As soon as a commit happens, it gets flowed down. Now, we do it and batch it up and group it up for efficiency and stuff, but there is no strict ordering there. But of course, it's a relational database. One, you'd like to make sure it's durable, right? And two, you need to make sure it's ordered. So we have durability tracking. So we basically keep track of what's been done, what is got four of six quorum. So here I'm showing, like, as you know, some of the storage nodes acknowledge, we'll get like to know which ones have been done, right? And you can see, like, for example, like here, A has got to 4, so we can return that to the user and say, that's committed, right? But notice that C is also at 4, right? But we haven't acknowledged it. And the reason is because we want ordering, right? And you notice that B is only at 3. So we have to wait for B to also get to 4 before we can essentially say, 
it's all good, right? So at that point, we can essentially return those to the customer, right? So this dramatically sort of changes how we can flow work down to the storage engine. So the other thing that's a bit different, as I said, there's no checkpoints, right? So if you have a block in memory and you do an update, right, you're going to end up with like, you know, the old deleted tuple as well as the newly inserted one, right? And in your wall, you're going to get, um, you're going to get not just the log vectors, right, but you're going to get a full page in the log stream, right? Now, Postgres has this really nice thing called full page rights, and it protects against uh, a form of corruption that I'll walk through. The first time you touch the block after a checkpoint, right, you have to eject a full page, right? So when you touch it again, when you do another change, like an insert there, you don't have to do another full page, right, because you haven't done a checkpoint yet. But once you do a checkpoint, right, you have to put that whole block out to, out to disk. We have to archive what's went through, you know, the log buffer and out through the wall stream, right? And the reason why we have to do the full block is because when we do a checkpoint, like on Linux, right, I got an 8K page in Postgres, but I'm writing 4K pages in Linux. So if in the middle of my checkpoint my box dies, I can get this happening, right, where only half of my write made it down to disk. Now, this would be silent corruption, right, because depending on what happens, the database would be like, oh, well, that checkpoint completed. I don't actually need to do anything with those blocks, right, and you'd have missing data. So what, of course, Postgres does is uses that full block to make sure that you don't end up with corruption, right? So this is a very good technique. It's running all the time, right? It's very well tested because it, it happens, you know, continually. But, of course, as you can see, this is a bit expensive, right, because you're doing a lot more work. So let's look at the difference of what happens when you don't have to do checkpointing. So I'll quickly just, you know, this is the exact same diagram, except for I'm just showing that, of course, you also have to back up your archive uh, archived wall to S3, right? So on the Aurora side, of course, um, when we do that update, you know, those two, th you know, changes happen. Those get sent to Aurora storage, and that gets sent to S3 for durability for backups, and that's essentially it, right? Even if you do another change, again, it just gets sent to Aurora storage. So no full page writes, right? No checkpointing to, to have to do to disk. It's just the log stream. Now, we are doing that to six places, so there is an increased overhead for that, but it typically is much less than the left side of the picture. Uh, yeah, so no checkpoints, no FPWs, and that's one of the reasons why we actually get much better performance. Um, so this is just illustrating, you know, if you have a B tree, right, and you're doing random inserts, right, so if I'm just, you know, I'm going to end up, like, loading a lot of blocks in the memory, but I'm also going to end up touching, let's say, the, changing the leaf block, right? And so if I'm doing, like, if I have a GUID and I'm doing random work like this, I end up touching a lot of blocks, right? So if we go back to my, you know, the first time you touch a block after a checkpoint, you have to do a full page, right? If you have a lot of indexes, if you have a lot of random workload, you're going to end up touching a lot of blocks, right? And so in this case, I'm just showing, like, hey, you've got, you know, No, 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 that's what I'm saying, just on the leaves of the changes, like not all of them, I'm saying. Right, but you're showing all the information. Well, yeah, I, I, was, I was saying you have to read those in, and, and then the last ones you probably have to write out. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the main thing is that not only, do, not only is randomness normally kind of painful because you have to have a lot of reads that, you know, have to read stuff that's possibly not in cache, but then you also end up modifying a lot more pages, right? So to show this, I actually did like a little benchmark where, I built a table that has, you know, a whole bunch of different, you know, kind of types just to show that, you know, there's nothing weird here. Um, some of them are random, like the UUID PK at the top. Some of them are more like the sequences that we would normally use. Uh, some of them are small, some of them are large. Um, and then the last thing is I had a timestamp that's right-leaning, right? And then I indexed every one of these columns, right? And that's not typical that you'd have a nine-column table with nine indexes. But how many people have customers that have, you know, 150 columns with nine indexes, right? That's actually quite common to have that or more, right? So we ran this test of seeing what we would get if we, you know, compared this to stock like sort of RDS Postgres versus Aurora. So on the red, this is a, an insert workload of that, you know, it's just, 
we basically used uh, PG Bench just to do a, a quick test on this. So it's in search per second on the vertical axis, so higher is better, and then I just ran it for a whole bunch of time, right? And so what you see with the red is the base sort of RDS Postgres with its standard defaults, which are a little higher than the default Postgres ones, but not huge. And what happens is, is the working set size gets larger, right? The performance dramatically drops because the number of random pages you're touching gets larger so that you're basically ejecting almost a full page write on every one of your changes, right? And because you have many indexes, you're ejecting one for all the indexes. Um, so of course, one of the ways to make that better is to make checkpoints further apart. So what I did in the green here was I increased my max wall segments to 16 gig. And you can see that we did get a performance improvement for a while. And this, you know, but over, as soon as the working set gets a lot larger, you still get that same behavior, right? Because of course, we don't do full page writes. Um, we, oops, sorry. We don't actually have this problem because, you know, our log buffer never gets sort of clogged up with full page writes. So our performance in the blue, you can see at top, is you know, why we get that performance, right? Now again, this is at full heavy write workload, right? This is not like, hey, if I'm doing a single you know, threaded uh, insert, this is pushing maximally with lots of connections, right? So just to show that it's not just an insert, yes? Awesome. So, uh, so I think the question was, I mean, really about caching and needing to load blocks. Um, in this case, this is a fully cached workload because I was trying to show mostly the write side of the equation and not the read side. Um, you would see differences, yes, on uh, some of the read latencies uh, between the two of them. So to show that this isn't just an up, uh, an insert thing, I did uh, an update test where I did uh, an update on this one random as well as this right leaning. Um, and we see basically the same thing, where we see um, our stock RDS Postgres getting about um, 3,700 uh, TPS for about 7,000 uh, changes per second. Um, when we tuned the wall, we got some improvement, uh, and then we get a big improvement off of, um, off of the Aurora change. Now, partly this is one of those two changes. Uh, uh, since these are all indexed, you know, we're not getting hot, of course, because we're updating things that... Uh, you know, so it's very expensive from an actual update perspective, right? Which is one of the reasons why this is the low number that it is. So one of the other kind of interesting things is, so Aurora Postgres is doing recovery, but it's doing recovery continuously, right? It's doing it at the storage level. So you can imagine a block coming in and getting updated by log records and continuously being recovered. And it's doing that distributed across hundreds or thousands of nodes all the time, right? So there is no crash recovery. So with Postgres, I, we did a test here where we're, we're doing a right workload, right? More writes are better. Uh, and then the vertical axis is recovery time. This is actually David's slide. He did a really nice job on the, on the chief uh, Excel architect. PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Well, no, I mean, but the graph. The graph, anyway. The, um, so the, the horizontal axis is the writes per second, right? So you'd like that to be as, as, as the far end of the right side. So when we started pushing, right, like we're getting three gig of redo um, at about 18,000 writes per second, right? So this is with a certain number of threads just to keep things kind of interesting. It took 19 seconds to recover, right? So as you push more, you're going to get more logs between the checkpoints, right? So we keep pushing. We get faster. We almost, you know, get to about 30,000. And now we're doing 10 gig of redo between each of the checkpoints, right? So our recovery time has went up to 50 seconds. As I push even harder, I get up to you know, almost doubling the initial one, but now I'm at 123 seconds for recovery time, right? So from a customer perspective, you have to say, would you like to have you know, really small crash recovery, or would you like to have really fast write rates? Right? So this is kind of the direction that you get when you push harder. See this little dot out here? That's the Aurora one. So basically, crash recovery takes about three seconds for us, and that's mostly just like starting the engine, not really, because there's no real crash recovery. Uh, and obviously, as I showed before, we get better write rates because of all the other stuff that we just talked about. So let's talk about durability and why we chose our 406 quorum. So for EBS, we essentially today have 
with our multi-AZ product, we have four copies. We do to two availability zones, and inside of that, EBS, of course, is maintaining two copies. So, you know, two copies in each side. And people said to us early on, said, well, what about doing six copies, right? Having it across three availability zones. Like, why don't you do that? So we actually did some, you know, thinking about that. And, you know, what it looks like when you try to write to six places is, you know, you have something that might be local, and you have some remote stuff. And there's all kinds of variability in how long it takes to write across different networks, to different machines, how loaded they are, right? And so as the writes go out and then start coming back, you can see that you get all kinds of different latencies, right? So that's just to sort of illustrate. And if you're really waiting for six of six copies, you have to wait for the last one to get done before you can say committed, right? So we actually ran a test of this. So adding extra synchronous replicas, right? So what I've done is in the blue, it's, it's essentially what RDS multi-AZ is, which is two uh, AZs with four copies of the data versus three availability zones with six copies. Latency is on the vertical axis, and this is like the, we're looking at the percentiles for the writes, right? So the 50th percentile, so you're sort of almost your average write, you can see that between these two things, it's only a millisecond difference because you know, the second AZ and the third AZ are probably not that different, right? So you're, you're only picking up a little bit more latency. But here's the big thing, right? Down at the four nines, right? One in 10,000 IOs is taking, you know, 120 plus milliseconds to get done. Now think back to when we talked about the log buffer, right? And you're flushing the log buffer and you have to wait for that log buffer to be flushed before you can take more work. So that one in 10,000 time basically is going to, instead of taking, you know, 20 milliseconds, is now going to take, you know, 120 milliseconds. So for that 100 milliseconds, no other work is going to get sent down to get committed, right? So this has dramatic effects. So for Aurora, what we do is we do six copies, but we send them out all at the same time. But as soon as the first four get back, right, we're done. Like the other ones still continue, but we don't actually have to wait for them, right? And so we can continually just be sending IOs down. So this is a sysbench run. Um, this is the P95 response time. <coughs> so response times vertical access, lower is better in this graph. So we run it for a long period of time. We see in the blue is RDS Postgres, single AZ, no backups turned on. And the yellow is Aurora Postgres with its four of six quorum, right? So in general, and again, this is at high right, well, high write workload, you know, full rates, 1,000 clients, right? This is checkpointing, right? This is, you can see clearly, those are the checkpoint intervals, right, that we were doing. And that's because at the bottom here, it actually looks pretty good. It, it is almost pretty close, right? But once you start pushing that IO subsystem and you start causing more jitter, and then the log buffer now is getting wedged behind other things, and you end up with these kind of varying response times, right? So it's just one of those nice things about not having to do checkpoints. So let's talk a little bit more about sort of the differences on sort of replication and cloning. So when we build you an RDS machine, right, it's just a head node with EBS on the bottom. When you ask us for a read replica, we take a snapshot of that, you know, EBS volume and we fire up another EBS volume and we attach a head node, right? But that takes it a bunch of time. And while that's happening, right, you're accumulating essentially changes that have to be shipped over. So there's a period of sort of catch up while you get that replica caught up and ready to go that you can actually probably use. And then, you know, it's all good. That takes, you know, depending on, we've had some customers that can take hours. So when you do an update, right, what you're going to do is you're possibly, you're going to, you know, write that to EBS and get that acknowledgement back, right? And at the same time, you're going to send over an asynchronous request to the standby. And it's going to possibly have to read that block in, and then it's going to write it out, right? So that's the kind of typical work that has to be done on a Postgres replica. On Aurora, it's quite different, because we have this clustered storage. So when you want another node, we just add it, right? We just attach it to the storage. And it's that quick, right? It's like literally the time to fire up a node. Um, and so this is very handy for our customers where they're like, you know, they have peaks and stuff where they're like, oh, I need to go throw in like three more read replicas at it. And they can do that inside of like an hour, right? You know, and, and you know, from a production perspective, 
they can know that they can do it in minutes, so they don't actually have to plan long times ahead. When we do an update for Aurora, we basically have to write that to Aurora storage, right? The log has to go down there. But we don't actually have to write on the read-only node, right? We do have to do asynchronous replication because we have stuff in memory, right? And you wouldn't want to be reading that because it would be stale, right? So we have to go and tell that other node that we've made that change. But we only have to do those updates for the things that are in memory. So any change that is not in memory, we get to throw on the floor. And I'll, I'll show why that's important. So if you think about PG Bench, right? So I'm not sure how many people you know, kind of use that a lot, but the four tables, right? get written to in the read-write workload, right? So if you run the read-write one, you're going to touch all four of those tables. But if you're running the read-only workload, right, you only read against the accounts. So if you were setting up Postgres and you wanted to run this benchmark, read-write and read-only, that's what you'd expect, right? So what's interesting with Postgres, when you do the asynchronous replication is, you're forcing essentially those other three tables to be read in and maintained in memory on your replica while, while the benchmark's running. On Aurora, this is quite different in that our asynchronous replication only has to do in-memory updates, so only has to have the accounts table in. And we only have to make updates to the memory for the accounts table. So to show this kind of dramatically, what I've done is run PG Bench, where I'm running read-write at 8,000 TPS on the primary. And then on the replica, I'm running read-only at 20,000 reads per second uh, on it. So time along the bottom. Vertical access, uh, this, the orange line is the write IOPS on the replica. Uh, this green line is the replication delay. And this is for RDS, it's in seconds, um, which is historical based on MySQL replication, which was always so shitty that measuring it in less than a second wasn't useful. Um, I still need to get that fixed, right, Nathan? Uh, so what I did here was I did a backfill on PG Bench history, right? So it's in the middle of this big run. I basically went and did an update where I updated all the rows. Because nobody ever does a backfill on the tables in production, right, of a large table in any of your databases ever, right? It's never happened. So what happened here? We start losing 30 seconds for every minute of wall clock time on our replica as it's struggling to push that massive change through the system, right? And what you'll notice here on the blue line is at some point, we start having to actually read, that's the read IOPS, in on the replica because we've now been forced to go load the PG Bench history table on the replica where we weren't actually changing it. And now we're losing almost 40 seconds for every 60 seconds on the replica, right? So until this whole thing gets through, we're not even going to get close to catching up, right? So this would be disastrous if someone does this to your production system, right? So. This is Aurora, same test, same run, exact same thing, right? The only major difference is that um, I screwed up and put the, uh, the uh, latency on the other side of the graph, sorry. Um, it's also in milliseconds for Aurora, because we corrected that for, for that. What you notice here, this green line now, if I didn't have where that red arrow was, would you be able to tell when we did the backfill? No. Because again, we don't actually have to do more work, right? We get to essentially send this across and say, look, it's for PG Bench history. We don't have PG Bench history in memory. We can throw those, those changes away, right? Now, this does have the obvious downside of it doesn't do cache warming in the same way as a normal Postgres replica. But it has the upside of not having to be disrupted by anything that is not sort of part of your production workload, right? The other cool feature that we get from having sort of this storage-based uh, architecture is that we get cool features like cloning. So here I'm depicting our read-write node, our application, and the primary storage showing all the little blocks across the Aurora storage, right? The cool thing is you can now set up what we call clones or fast clones. And you go in, you just say, create a fast clone of this existing database. Now, you can still have read-only nodes and all that stuff that I've shown. So you sit and say, I want to clone. Now, why would you want to clone? So a clone is essentially a copy on write. So you can use this for developers. So let's say you have a 60 terabyte database in production. And the developer says, I really need to test something, and I really need production data. And you're like, today what you'd have to do is do a restore on and find a machine with you know, 60 terabytes or even pay for it on something like EBS. And you know, the developer might need that for a day, a week, or whatever. 
Now what you can do with something like this is we can do clones where it's copy on write. So when you set up the clone, there is actually no storage really, right? It's all just pointers back to the primary storage. So until the customer goes and actually changes something, so if someone does an update on this clone, then what we'll do is we'll make a copy of that block and put it in the clone storage, right? And the only thing you're paying for is that block. I mean, there's chunks, but you know, you get the idea, right? And you know, you still get to go and change the primary, but the clone is not keeping up. It's a point in time of that thing that you get to diverge. Yes? Uh, the question is, can you do PITR, like, can you do clones based on sort of an older point in time? Not at the moment. It's a, at the moment, it's you clone from, like, where you are when you do them. So um, there's definitely a bunch of things that we've talked about doing that would make this more flexible. Um, but, yeah, at the moment, it's just the instant that you call our API is what you get for, uh, for a clone, right? Um, some other folks are using this for reporting where they'll make a cut of a clone and then be able to go in and, let's say, build indexes and go run you know, different reporting and then throw it away at the end of the day, right? So lots of interesting sort of things. And that's just one of the things about having sort of a, you know, a, a more complex storage system is you can get to do some of these things that you would normally have to do at a sort of a database layer instead. And I just showed you, like, if you, you, know, if you add a new block here, you don't end up like doing it here because it's just for the primary storage. So caching, um, Postgres is a very interesting engine in that it's one of the few uh, database engines that has uh, caching outside of the uh, engine buffers, right? It uses the page cache in, you know, in the operating system, which has a whole bunch of benefits, um, but it is quite different than, than, let's say, MySQL, Oracle, and a bunch of the other ones, right? So. Um, we had to make some changes uh, for Aurora because we don't actually have a page cache, because we don't actually have a file system. We don't actually write to standard storage. So I'm showing on the left how we configure RDS Postgres. So we have basically, we allocate about 20, set aside about 25% of the space for the Postgres processes and the OS, right? Um, we allocate about a quarter of the memory for shared buffers, and the rest is Linux page cache. So that's really good. Um, that's sort of our stock setup. So when you ask for something in Postgres, right, like what it's going to do is it's going to sit there and say, hey, I'm going to go try to look for it in shared buffers. And if it's not there, it's going to go do a disk read, right? That's actually going to look in the page cache to see if it's there first, right? And if it's not, it'll actually go to EBS and it's coming all the way back, right? Pretty standard stuff. On Aurora, we set up, again, the quarter for Postgres and the OS. And then the rest of it's in shared buffers. So the whole thing is this three quarters of the RAM is in shared buffers, right? And this is because we have no page cache, so why would we you know, leave anything for that? So very similarly, when you go to look for data, right, when you do a select, it's going to look in shared buffers. But now if it's not there, it's, the read's going to go directly to Aurora storage, right, and come back. OK? So one of the cool things about Postgres is when Postgres dies, you lose the shared buffers, right? But most customers don't care because guess what? Their data is in the Linux page cache, right? So you start back up, and you actually have pretty good performance. Yes, Tom? Don't you also need some memory for stuff like hash joins and sorting and stuff like that? Yeah, well, that's, that's part of the in, the, in the percentage of the Postgres process is what I meant. Like, you know, the sorry, per process memory stuff is all in that 25. The customer can change any of these settings, right, to, if they're like more, uh, if they need more stuff for those kind of like reporting or other kind of, you know, or maintenance or, you know, whatever. So this is just sort of our stock kind of, you know, roughly useful for, for most people. So Postgres customers are happy because, guess what? They got their data in the Linux page cache. When the Postgres restarts, the performance is quite good, right? Because you're not reading everything back from EBS cold. Now, as you can imagine, we had a problem here because we don't have a Linux page cache. Um, so what we actually had to do was we actually had to do work on this so that we had what we call survival cache. So we actually go through and invalidate um, the shared memory. We have actually have it uh, separated from the Postgres processes. Um, we invalidate the, the pieces that we shouldn't uh, have, and we keep the shared memory alive between, uh, between restarts of Postgres. Um, so this basically gives the customer the same sort of happiness uh, on both systems. So 
So one of the interesting things was I was, as we started doing this work, I was like, well, how does this look like from an actual performance perspective, the difference between what we've done and what stock looks like? So to test that, I want to do a read-only test, right, because I'm, I want to look just at how well we're, you know, caching and doing those reads. So I'm running PG Bench read-only, uh, scale 22,000. So this is quite big, right? It's a 300 gig, 350 gig working set. Now I'm running this on our R416 that has, you know, just slightly less than half a T of RAM, right? Um, and its vertical axis is transactions per second. So with Aurora at 75% cache, we get almost 700,000 reads per second, which is really quite cool, right? I mean, just, you know, for any of us that started running databases 20 years ago, right? Like the fact that, you know, we have a single box that can do that kind of number is, is pretty crazy. So the next thing I did was I ran RDS Postgres with its stock setting of 25% shared buffers, right? And I get a number that's 417,000. I was like, wow, that's, that's a lot lower than I thought. So of course, you start looking. When you run a benchmark, you got to go look at everything. And you're like, oh, wait, I was doing 18,000 read IOPS. Well, that's why my performance was so horrible. And the reason is, is because it's 350 gig, right? And because we have some amount of double buffering happening, because we have the shared buffer set to a quarter, we can't actually fit the whole 350 in to the combination of shared memory and the page cache. So it was forcing the database to go actually do reads. So I thought, well, OK, let's, that's not fair. Let's try to get it so it's not doing reads. So what I did was I set the shared buffers to 10%, right? So this gave more room for the page cache to fully cache stuff. And I got a worse result. So this was not really going well. And I was like, what's going on here? And the fact is that it's because of double buffering, right? Now, this is a very, you know, latency sensitive test, right? We're running at 100% CPU on this box, right? So any use of extra CPU is going to slow you down. And essentially what you're seeing is that effect of actually having to go down to the page cache to get the data is causing that much overhead that you actually have a reduction. Now, this is obviously the worst case example, right? No one's actually going to see this in production, right? Because nobody does 100% cached read workload, right, in this way. So, but it's just to illustrate that there is an overhead to the double buffering, right? And to, to prove that we weren't doing anything weird, um, if I go set Postgres to having a 75% buffer, shared buffers, right, I get essentially the same result as Aurora Postgres, right? Now, the only problem with that is that there's no double buffering, but if you crash because it's only in shared buffers, guess what? You don't have a survivable cache anymore. So let's talk a little bit about vacuuming. Um, sure. Oh, yes. No, it doesn't, it doesn't crash that often. Um, and I mean, there's crashing and there's also restarts for parameter changes that aren't dynamic, right? Those are the two common cases, right? But um, it doesn't have to happen very often. If you're talking about someone that's got 350 gig of, of data in cache, um, like to warm that takes a long time, right? So from a customer perspective, it doesn't have to happen very often for it to be painful for them, right? So. Let's talk about vacuuming a bit. Everybody kind of understands probably in this room why vacuuming matters. I give this talk to lots of people who, who don't, you know, kind of understand a bunch of this stuff. But, you know, obviously, you know, when we're making changes in Postgres, you need a vacuum, right? You need to clean stuff up because if you don't, right, if you run vacuum and you clean stuff up, then you've got extra space to go reuse, right? You've got less garbage. You've got less stuff you have to work through in your cache. Uh, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do, right? So you know, you need to be able to vacuum. So one of the interesting things was, as we were working on this and we were like, wow, we managed to get the write rates up to 3x what we can do in stock Postgres, my concern was, oh, well, what if we can't get vacuum to go any faster? This will probably not end well for our customers, right? Because they're going to end up with more blocks, more cache misses, more full page writes, more non-hot updates. It was just going to be like, ah, right? Very bad, right? Um, and you know, just to show people like what happens over time when vacuum is like not keeping up, if you're running a long running workload, right, what you would expect is sort of you'd want the red line to happen, right? But if you're not vacuuming and keeping up, you get this slow drift down as you get, you know, more blocks, more cache misses, you know, just generally badness, right? And then of course, you know, also, you know, that kind of transaction wraparound, that minor thing, right? No no one ever hits, but you know, 
except for like we had to add, actually add a metric in RDS so that our customer would be like, look, seriously, you're at a billion, like do something. So one of the other things that was interesting about Vacuum that, you know, that's kind of cool that Postgres does is it doesn't have to do prefetch because it gets to use the operating system to help it fetch blocks in, right? It doesn't have to have a whole bunch of code there to do that piece. But again, we were like, oh, we don't have that. We're going to actually have to do something about it. Um, in doing that, it was kind of interesting looking at this. So with 9.6, you know, you have basically a map now f to look at frozen stuff, right, or the stuff that needs to be uh, frozen. And I'm trying to illustrate that here. If you imagine like a whole bunch of uh, blocks and sort of the peachish color ones need to be frozen, right? Now you actually have a map to them, so you can actually just go from a vacuuming of the heap, you can just go do that, right? So if you imagine, that's what you'd kind of expect Postgres to have to go do is it's vacuuming, right? Like read just those ones. Um, but Postgres has an optimization to say, well, because we want to try to get the operating system to do prefetch, um, if those blocks are within 32 of each other, we're actually going to end up doing this, right? Because it's going to want the operating system to just be scanning, right? So I'm not sure if actually this is an, you know, actually still a good optimization given what we run on today. Um, but regardless, for us, because we have no you know, operating system to, to do prefetch for us, it wasn't going to matter. So in Aurora Postgres, what we do is we actually go and get all those addresses. And we do one, basically, I.O. up to 256 that we send down a request for to get those back, right? So we do batch I.O. intelligent prefetch here. Um, this results in about uh, a good 50% faster vacuum. The other thing with our vacuum is, of course, when we vacuum, we don't have full page rights, right? So our cost to actually vacuum a page is much less. So the amount of writing we do, again, is less for vacuum, which means we can make vacuum not only faster but more aggressive in, in Aurora Postgres. So to show that, uh, Postgres took 402 seconds to do this, and Aurora took 163 to do the test I, I ran, right? Um, and that's, that's, you know... Again, the, you could probably tune some stuff in Postgres to get that faster, but it was more illustrating, like, we, we basically needed to do this so that because we were writing faster, we needed to make sure Vacuum could keep up. Um, one of the other interesting ones is that working with some customers, um, we actually worked on sort of the thought of vacuuming in memory for some workloads, right? Like, if you have, let's say, a small heap-only table um, or something with maybe right-leaning indexes or very few indexes, there's the possibility of vacuuming just in memory, right? Not waiting for the stuff to get written down to disk before you vacuum. And of course, obviously, you can't have a lot of long-running transactions because that would block, block stuff as well, right? So going back to my illustration, right? If you have a block in memory, and you, you, let's say you're doing inserts into it, right? You know, it's, you know, you're filling it up, and then you checkpoint that out, and you, know, you archive the wall. But guess what? It's not frozen, right? So at some point, you're going to have to read it back in to vacuum it. And guess what? Since that's the first time you've touched it since checkpoint, you've got to full page write it again. You've got to send all that back out again. It's kind of painful, right? And what you really want to do is to optimize this, where you know, essentially right after the block is full, you would like to essentially vacuum it right then. And that way, you're checkpointing out the nicely frozen one and you're archiving and you're done, right? Now, this only works for particular workloads because, obviously, if you're doing different, you know, things, this isn't going to work. But just for, like, sort of append-only or small kind of circular stuff, you can do this. But the, the challenge with this is that you actually have to do it with inside of a checkpoint, right, if you're running on stock Postgres. Um, now, the cool thing is with Postgres, because you can set per table vacuum things, you can actually do this, like, for just one of your tables if it fits this model. Um, so the cool thing with Aurora is, because we don't have checkpoints, um, we don't actually have to worry about doing it inside of a checkpoint, right? So the vacuuming in memory took, like, in my example, 72 seconds. Um, we're not even going to look at the vacuuming after checkpoint, right, because that isn't a thing. And, you know, we can still see that we managed to do it in 72 seconds instead of 163, right? So it shows that if you can get away with, like, figuring out how to get your application to vacuum in memory, you can actually um, substantially reduce the amount of work that your overall system is doing. Uh, as part of uh, our work on Aurora, we um, introduced uh, into preview uh, 
a product called Performance Insights. And so this is a, basically a graphical monitoring tool um, to look at uh, essentially weights and what's going on inside your database. Um, we actually backported a bunch of the uh, Postgres 10 weight events into the 9.6 stuff um, so that we'd have a little richer ones. And then we added specific ones for Aurora. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, what, you know, that you can diagnose more rapidly, you know. And so this was, having weight events in Postgres was a huge deal. What we wanted to do was to make it easier for customers to be able to see this. Um, so you can actually drill in and see exactly, you know, what's going on with the database, right? And you can get down to, hey, here's the query that's causing, you know, like high CPU on my system. So, of course, uh, it's very, you know, interesting to have this cool shiny toy, but then what customers tell us is that's all great, but now I need to migrate to it. What's the story there, right? Um, so there's basically about, you know, four main methods that we talk to customers about. There's like a fifth one missing here, obviously. Um, so the first thing is we have this thing called DMS, our migration service. So that's um, a CDC captured one. I'll talk about that briefly. Um, I'm not going to talk to you guys about PG dump, PG restore, because if you're here, you probably know that one. Um, we have a way to move from RDS Postgres in called snapshot import. And then we just introduced uh, a way to have you be able to have an Aurora read replica of an RDS Postgres instance. So I'll walk through that. So DMS is a logical replication, like the service is called data migration service, but I really wanted to call it data replication service because that's really at the heart of what it is. It's a CDC capture and replay um, mechanism. So it can run any of those, it can run against any of those sources, so pretty much all the common stuff. I think we've added DB2 now as well as a source. Um, and so whether this is on-premise, on EC2, in RDS, you can point this at it. So what you do is, you know, you figure out your source, you create an Aurora Postgres instance, and you start a replication instance. And this is basically another EC2 node that's running our DMS software. And you define what you're going to replicate across. And you connect the source and target. And like if this is Postgres, it's using the logical replication slots and all the goodness that's in Postgres. It does a full select on the table, you know, pulls it over, and then basically catches up based on the CDC coming out of the logical replication scheme, right? So this allows customers to quickly like then fail over. So this is one way that we, you know, support customers either moving from other engines. And we have a lot of customers for Aurora coming from Oracle and SQL Server especially uh, coming in today. Um, our original uh, way to move from RDS uh, was to do snapshot import. So if you had your RDS Postgres instance, you'd ask us to uh, move it. You'd have to have a snapshot first. You have to shut down your application. You know, you basically create an Aurora Postgres instance from that snapshot, and you can start your application again. And this worked fine for, you know, kind of proof of concept, dev test kind of stuff, but obviously the downtime for that for production would be ridiculous for most people, right? Um, so the second generation of this is very similar in that we have um, your RDS Postgres instance. You ask us to create a Aurora read replica. We'll take a snapshot. We'll convert that snapshot into an Aurora um, cluster. And then we'll wire up a Postgres asynchronous wall-based replication. So we're actually doing like the normal read replica thing there. Uh, and then once it's caught up, you can just fail over, right? So that takes, you know, that can take, a, you know, couple minutes and you can be, you know, live. And we've had a couple, a number of customers move from, from there to there. And with that, I will close out and then take any questions on, uh, on Aurora or anything else you'd like to know. Yes, Robert. So, you know, over and over again in this talk, you say that you don't have checkpoints. Yes. Well, so we don't have checkpoints at the head node. Right, so, so we don't have checkpoint in the standard way because we, we never write copies of blocks in the same way that checkpoint does, right? We merge the log vectors into blocks in the storage node in a distributed fashion. So, so it's... you still have to write an f thing those changes... Nope, nope. Before you can throw away... The nope. Log. We, don't, we don't ever throw away the log. Yeah. Sequential scan, right? Uh, right. Like all we're in that database. When you're doing the sequential scan, that sequential scan is going to read the blocks and yes. the storage engine. Right? Yeah. So the changes that you applied into the storage engine yeah. somehow needs to be reconciled to, to become Postgres SQL blocks 
Well, that's what I'm saying. That happens on the fly as the log vectors flow down to the storage system. It happens on the fly, but it still happens. So yeah, yeah, well, a penalty yes. when you're applying this, say, in this case, the sequential scan, right? Like, the, there is, uh, whether you do it in batches in checkpointing or sure. whether it happens on yeah. the fly, there is... Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we're still, we're still merging blocks. I'm not, yeah, I'm not trying to say we don't do that. I'm just saying we don't do checkpointing in the standard flush everything down, write a block, right, in that way. It's different. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to say there's not work going on. But the thing that's interesting is it's, it's fully parallel across all the blocks, right? So that, and there's no ordering that has to happen from a checkpoint perspective, right? That merging happens all the time. Can I, can I give this a shot? Sure, yeah, you can try it. Yeah. 